Okay, we're going to go ahead and get started again. For those of you who just joined, welcome to our webinar today. Live streaming is the next BYOD for the enterprise. I'm Darian Germain, VBreak Vice President of Marketing, and we are delighted to have with us two leading industry analysts from Frost & Sullivan, Makul Krishna, who is Global Director of Digital Media for Frost, and Anisha Vinny, who is Program Manager and Senior Analyst. Uh, Anisha is going to be our key presenter today. She's also the author of a white paper that we'll make available to you during this webcast. A few short logistical notes. Um, our live webcast today is, of course, taking place over Bbrick's Rev Enterprise video platform. My video source is a video conferencing endpoint here in Bbrick's headquarters just outside of Washington, D.C. Anisha's video source is another video conferencing unit um, from Houston, Texas. And McCool is going to be joining us also from Texas from a webcam. Um, there are a few ways that you'll be able to interact with our speakers during the presentation. Please look at your Rev Media Player. In the upper right-hand corner, there's a question button. Please feel free throughout the webcast to submit your questions, and we'll, we'll have a Q&A session at the end to answer um, everything that you brought up. Um, also, another nice feature is in the lower right-hand corner of the Rev Media Player, you'll see three icons. The third one from the left gives you the ability to toggle between multiple layouts during the live webcast. So as soon as Anisha starts presenting, there'll be two streams. One will be her data source, which is the slides, and the other is video. And you can toggle between those views if you'd like to make the video larger or the, or the screens as you like. So without further ado, I'd like to get to the content portion of our webcast and uh, go ahead and turn it over to McCool to get us started. Very kind words. Uh... Uh, just to provide some quick context before we start. So at Frost and Sullivan, we have been uh, tracking and analyzing the enterprise video market for over a decade now. Uh, and in fact, for the past uh, uh, two years, uh, VBRIC has been also recognized as uh, the market leader within our webcasting analysis. Um, we have also been looking at analysis and seeing how very consistently for the uh, past quite a few years, you've been seeing a surge in demand. There's a tremendous amount of interest for enterprise video. And um, one of the reasons that we are therefore delighted to partner with VBREAK on today's webinar, as well as the white paper, because you want to provide our feedback and assessment of what are the exact dynamics that are going into fueling all of this growth. And this is uh, particularly true when we're looking at uh, growth in consumer live streaming services. You know, we're all familiar now with Facebook Live and YouTube Live and how they're driving interest by employees. Uh, we're looking at a much younger demographic within organizations who are asking the companies uh, when they can use all of these sort of tools, the simple uh, tools that work. Uh, having said that, I would like to now turn it uh, turn the floor over to Anisha. Uh, she's a senior analyst and program manager of a streaming video practice uh, within Frost and Sullivan. Uh, she's also the primary author of the paper that we are going to learn a lot about. Uh, Anisha. Well, uh, good morning, everyone. I'm Anisha Vinny. I'm an industry analyst with the digital media practice at Frost and Sullivan. I work from Houston, and together with Mukul Krishna. I cover a range of uh, video markets, enterprise video platforms uh, being one of the more exciting ones. Um, so in a nutshell, today we are going to talk about why you should care about video, how is it growing, where is that growth coming from. Uh, we're going to focus on two trends in particular um, that are affecting enterprise communications and the way enterprises are communicating today. Uh, the first one is the shifting workplace dynamics. And the second is the tremendous growth in live streaming. Um, down the line, we're also going to be talking about the factors that are challenging the adoption of enterprise video and also about technology solutions that exist to help overcome some of these challenges and to help you tell your story, whether it is to your employee base, to investors, to partners, to suppliers, to customers. Um, finally, we will wrap up. There's going to be some closing thoughts and key takeaways. So why should you care about enterprise video? Uh, because video, very simply put, is the fastest growing content type within the enterprise. Um, at every large global organization with a dispersed workforce, across every vertical, video is growing. And at Frost & Sullivan, according to our research, we find that enterprises routinely produce uh, more 
video than even media and entertainment organizations. Uh, just to draw a comparison, in 2015, Hollywood released about 300 titles, uh, which made for anywhere between 600 and 900 hours of video content. Uh, whereas a European FMCG in the same time frame produced close to 25,000 hours of enterprise video. Um, now, for the past several years, we've been um, seeing enterprises use video to positively impact their bottom line. So I can go on about uh, the advantages of using video as a tool to drive down cost, uh, the role it's playing in saving you time and travel, and the slew of operational efficiencies that it's going to help you unlock. But I think what is far more interesting is how large and mid-sized organizations that operate in very demanding competitive environments are using video as a strategic tool um, to drive their top line. It is powering product launches, sales enablement efforts, um, communicating product and service updates, helping to better engage the customer. And I think what's very interesting is how CEOs today are using video to engage their employees, uh, to communicate their organizational vision, to drive change efforts and to really reassure their employees in times of crises and downturns. Um, so video today, as we are seeing it, is making organizations agile and it's really enabling them to gain a competitive advantage. Um, we routinely see that the typical employee today watches more than eight hours of work-related video every month. Um, a survey that we conducted recently shows that more than 90% of enterprises are using video in some form to power their learning and development efforts. I love this quote from Mark Zuckerberg, who says that video, put very simply, is a mega trend. And Facebook has a video first strategy for that reason. And more and more, we see Periscope and YouTube and increasingly Instagram essentially following down that same path. And it's not very surprising because if a picture is worth a thousand words, then video is really worth a million. And in the enterprise, it's helping to humanize communications sales, training, and all types of enterprise relationships. When done well, video is going to allow you to captivate your viewer's imagination. It helps you tell a story in a way that a newsletter or an email never can. Um, this is a stat from the 2016 Cisco Visual Networking Index report, um, where it states that business IP traffic is growing at a cumulative annual growth rate of 18% from 2015 to 2020. And we, we will see advanced enterprise video communications causing that IP traffic to double within the same time frame. Our own research um, at Frost & Sullivan has the enterprise video platforms market growing at uh, a cumulative annual growth rate of close to 20%. Um, we will see this growth largely driven by large enterprises in North America and Western Europe, but Asia Pacific, while it is the smallest market today, is also the fastest growing and use cases for video are exploding in that uh, in many of the developed countries in that market. This is a slide about the potential of the enterprise video market. Um, the total addressable market for enterprise video solutions as we see it today among large and mid-sized organizations around the world is estimated to be close to $13.9 billion. Uh, the currently served market is only a meager 2.5% of this total time. Um, and I think that goes to demonstrate the tremendous potential of the enterprise video opportunity going forward. So what is driving the enterprise video boom? I think video is um, a very good tool in the arsenal of any CEO or corporate communicator of a large enterprise with a globally dispersed workforce. It is making for a sticky and engagement experience, a st sticky engage and very engaging experience and um, I think routinely, we're also seeing that it breeds new life and gives a lot of authentic authenticity to drab corporate communications um, that go you know, in a newsletter or in an email. Uh, video solutions um, are vertical agnostic, but we also do see that financial services and business and technology services firms are the earliest and the greatest adopters of video. Commercial banks, uh, insurance companies, investment banks, brokerage firms, buyer-side institutions, mutual funds, et cetera, um, are among those included in the financial services segment. And because it is a heavily regulated sector, the need for compliance training is what we see driving vast amounts of the enterprise video use. Um, business and technology services firms are similarly um, a very early adopter of enterprise video. They form the second largest group of EVP clients. Um, large enterprises with 
global teams. Um, many of these business and technology uh, services firms use video for CEO communications, corporate training, employee boarding, um, etc. Healthcare institutions um, and pharmaceuticals are another um, pretty large adopter of enterprise video solutions as we see it. Um, we see EVPs integrating with solutions um, that are patient systems so that video can be brought into hospital rooms and surgical suites. Retail and manufacturing are um, the smaller but also the fastest growing adopting verticals for enterprise video. I think with, within all these verticals, the function of video is the same. Uh, it is a tool to educate, to communicate, to sell. The CEO All Hands uh, continues to be the largest um, and you know drives the most adoption of the enterprise video use. Uh, corporate communications, training, onboarding, sales enablement um, are others significantly growing use cases. So in this next section here, we're going to talk about the modern workplace um, and the three underpinning trends that are driving this evolving workforce. The first is the rising percentage of millennials in the workforce. The second is the connected devices and the BYOD explosion. And the third is workplace flexibility. Um, so traditionalists is the generation that is between the age of 65 and 88. And we see that this generation is quickly disappearing from the workforce. Uh, this generation was characterized by loyalty, stability, and attention to detail. The baby boomers, uh, that's people between the age group of 46 and 64 are rapidly reaching retirement age. Millennials today are making up, I think back in 2014, were making up about a third of the population. And by 2025, it is, assume, it is expected that millennials will form about 75% of the total American workforce. And they are fundamentally different from any of these other groups and generations that we're talking about. Um, I saw a tidbit from the CEO of PepsiCo in India recently who said that millennials are great for the traditional enterprise, uh, but it is also challenging in many ways. Uh, millennials don't like hierarchy. Uh, they want to do things yesterday, not today. Uh, they come to work because they believe that there's progress to be made um, and because they have great colleagues. They act in a way like volunteers and not so much like employees, and they volunteer because they believe in this cause of your company and where you're headed. Um, they believe that they need 100% of the information 100% of the time, and open communication is very critical for this generation. Uh, he also says that the biggest stress about having millennials in your organization is with leadership, right? Because millennials want your time, and the leadership needs to be out of their offices and meeting these people. What they want from you is transparency. They want engagement, they want a sense of purpose and a personal connection. Um, and I think the larger the organization, the more challenging this is. And in their everyday lives, I think video is the norm for the millennial generation. Uh, the oldest of the millennials have themselves begun to become um, you know, a big part of the C-suite. So all these characteristics are going to have to weigh in while you craft a communication strategy that engages them and an IT investment strategy that enables that engagement. Um, the next big trend that we're seeing in the enterprise is the BYOD boom. So the continued proliferation of smartphones, tablets, and personal devices have been happening for a long time. And IT decision makers have grappled about what to do with it for a long time. But I think they finally come to the conclusion that they're going to be at a competitive disadvantage if they did not embrace the trend in some way. 70% um, of American enterprises supported BYOD in some form uh, in 2014. And our research suggests that that number is expected to climb to 78% uh, by the end of 2018. Now, by encouraging BYOD, what companies are trying to do is uh, save on some of the high device and plan costs by no longer providing uh, devices to their employees. And this has you know, become BY made, made, made BYOD more of a requirement than a nice to have. Uh, what is great for video is that each of these BYOD devices holds the potential to become a live streaming source. The third major trend that we're seeing in the enterprise is increasing workplace flexibility. So I think um, telecommuting, for example, is no longer a perk that's offered by just a few sporadic organizations here and there. It's become way, way more commonplace. Um, according to this 2015 workplace survey by Gallup, uh, we see that the number of employees who at some point uh, in their career have worked remote has grown by 300% in the last 20 years. So I think that the long and short of it 
is that the workforce today is younger than it has ever been, it's more connected than it has ever been, and more dispersed than at any point in the past. Attrition and competition continue to be big challenges. And so speaking to this increasingly younger, more connected, more telecommuting workforce in their language and reaching them on their devices, in their homes and in their coffee shops, on their preferred medium, which is video, has never been more critical. So I agree that there is nothing that is as great as the introduction of a face-to-face -face meeting, but the workplace is fundamentally changing and you need to prepare your infrastructure and your technology to meet the needs of that modern workplace. So great content um, is going to be critical to this mix, right? So great content is king even at the enterprise, but innovating and engaging um, uh, formats of presentation are going to be important. So I know of media and entertainment organizations who are using um, cartoons, short films, and trailers to affect cultural change within their organizations. And I find that interesting, and I bet that that's a trend that's going to um, go on going forward. Uh, so the next big trend we're going to talk about is live streaming. Uh, live streaming, streaming has been exploding over the past uh, year or so, uh, and it's most definitely not a fad. So here are some statistics uh, that kind of speak to that. 80% of audiences spent more time watching video in 2016 than in 2015. 300 hours of video were uploaded to YouTube every minute. 200 million is the number of Periscope broadcasts today. Facebook, when it launched uh, Facebook Live, uh, is uh, set aside about 50 million US dollars to pay celebrities, influencers, and publishers to use that medium. Facebook also says that users spend three times as much time on a live video as compared to an on-demand asset. Uh, live streaming also has 10 times as much engagement and activity uh, compared to their on-demand versions. So live streaming is most definitely not a fad. It is a big part of your employees' life uh, every day and the way that they engage with technology. And uh, that is something that they are going to come to expect from their work lives as well. Um, in the past, we've seen that live streams power just the largest, biggest budget CEO broadcast and all hands meeting type use cases. But I think the need for live and real time information is increasing and it will be a source of competitive advantage moving forward. Um, so we're going to see live streaming uh, being used more and more to power investor relations broadcasts, crisis communications, product launches. Um, and wherever decisions need to be made, and crises need to be mitigated, the use cases for live are only growing. So a need for a robust um, enterprise video platform to deliver high quality, scalable live video in a secure manner is really driving the uptake of enterprise video solutions. Um, that's something that we're going to see throughout um, the forecast. Um, here we're going to touch briefly upon some other drivers that are um, causing enterprises to adopt video. Um, the first is the increasing use of uh, video to drive the content marketing use case and the sales process. Um, we see enterprise video platforms um, integrating with marketing automation solutions and CRM solutions. And that combination um, is really helping make lead generation and lead qualification way more effective uh, than in the past. Also, the proliferation of um, video enabled consumer devices means that everybody today holds a means of video production in their pockets. So video creation and production in a way has become truly democratized. Uh, what has resulted is a boom in the amount of employee generated content and the management and the governance of this employee generated content is driving an uptick um, in the need for solutions to manage all of this. And I think lastly, uh, but most importantly, probably, uh, video solutions today exist that are tailored to the business user. Employees want to create content and webcasts with minimal intervention from IT. And responding to this need, there are vendors in this space now um, that have developed self-service webcasting offerings that are catered to the business buyer that enables them to go live and webcast their presentation within a matter of minutes, like we're doing with Rev today. Um, so it's easy to use, easy to manage, and with the advent of cloud and self-service solutions that can be purchased in subscription pricing packages. Um, the video solution purchase has essentially gone from a CapEx thing to an OpEx um, purchase. So the need, um, the bottom line is that the need to seamlessly manage, store, protect, 
publish and deliver high quality live video, content has never been greater and that is going to drive this market going forward. Let's talk a little bit about the challenges in this market. Okay. Um, the number one challenge um, today is uh, for, for enterprise video platform deployments uh, is the enterprise network. So delivering corporate video uh, inside or outside the firewall, whether it's to a conference room or an employee at the airport, scalably and reliably is quite a complex endeavor and very few vendors in the space are really stepping up to that challenge. Providing optimized delivery to meet your available bandwidth during a live webcast is complicated. Um, and so that is one of the challenges uh, that uh, enterprises are going through. The second, I think most important one is market fragmentation. So the enterprise video market is an interesting one. So we've seen the traditional webcasters that play in this market, but there's also vendors from complementary markets like video conferencing and virtual events and uh, online video platforms too. So one of the things we're seeing is that this fragmentation of sorts is very confusing to the customer. I think comparing apples to apples in this market is not easy in terms of function, features, deployment, and pricing models. And this is often a challenge that um, interested buyers in this space have to go through. In many cases, we also see that EVPs are requested by heads of departments who are looking for an immediate solution to an urgent business need or problem, right? And then IT is brought to, brought to the table only much later. So that is a kind of a common reason behind um, prolonged sales, sales cycles and deployments of enterprise video platforms and solutions. Um, even where solutions are deployed, uh, we sometimes observe a lack of enterprise-wide adoption. And I would say that is mainly because there is often a cultural re resistance to be captured on video, especially by senior management and leadership. And we find that corporate sponsorship is very important uh, to build a video culture within an organization. And where that is lacking, solutions will be underutilized. Um, in, on a broader um, uh, note, I think slow economic growth in some way trickles down and affects IT uh, and enterprise budgets, uh, leaving insufficient funds. And sometimes in those cases, IT departments may choose to, uh, to upgrade existing software like your enterprise resource planning software or content management software. And that dampens investment in video solutions a little bit. I think we can go on to the technology piece of uh, this presentation. Um, so one of the things um, with the enterprise is that if you're not providing a solution, your employees are going to find it anywhere. And I think that um, in the enterprises, for example, if you don't have a cloud file sharing solution, your employees are going to use Dropbox. And that's the case with enterprise video. If you're not providing an enterprise video solution, your employees are going to use consumer video platforms to some extent to make it happen. And we want to make the case for an enterprise video platform. here. So, we're going to talk about the five ways in which uh, enterprise video platforms are different from consumer live streaming platforms. Um, and I think the five factors are quality, audience, security, bandwidth, and control. Um, we Consumer live streaming platforms may deliver good enough quality, um, but enterprise employees demand TV quality broadcasts. Um, consumer live streaming platforms are broadcast to the world in a very large audience. Whereas with the enterprise, you want your content to be viewed only by authorized users. Consumer platforms um, don't offer secure st uh, streaming, whereas enterprise streams uh, need to be protected and secure at the same time. Consumer platforms we see uh, use unlimited internet bandwidth, whereas enterprise platforms are really restricted by the limitations of bandwidth on your corporate network. Um, also, with consumer platforms like Facebook Live, the world is invited to comment and there's no control over that conversation. Whereas within the enterprise, you want to have tighter controls over conversational tools. Um, what should you know while choosing an enterprise video platform? So this is an image that we used to cross in Sullivan um, just for market education purposes. It depicts the enterprise video workflow, uh, the different parts of it, and all the tasks that are involved in taking video from capture to consumption. Um, but moving forward, I think this is the important part. What are the key considerations and factors that you need to think about while evaluating an enterprise video platform vendor and while making a purchase? Now, we find that um, successful deployments have a few things in common. Um, the first is that 
enterprises that are using enterprise video successfully um, have a single platform deployed. It's usually an end-to-end -end platform that serves all of your video needs. It can be used to deliver live streams as well as publish on-demand video assets. Um, it is a solution that it acts as a centralized repository for all of your video assets in the organization. Depending on your needs, it can be de deployed on premises, in the cloud, or more and more as we're seeing as a hybrid approach. Um, that integrates, uh, you, you also want your enterprise video platform to integrate with other commonly used enterprise software, like your enterprise resource planning software, your, your CRM solution, your ECM solution, marketing automation, video conferencing, enterprise social media. And this is so you can really get the most out of your video. Um, and as an extension of all this, your platform must ideally serve as a centralized repository of all things video within the enterprise. Um, and this is where we see that the marriage of video conferencing and EDP um, is a trend uh, going forward. In many cases, you see recorded and archived video conferences extremely cumbersome to find. And an unfindable asset is an unusable asset. So using your EVP for also storing, managing, and indexing uh, many of these video conferencing assets and making it searchable really helps utilize and leverage all of your video assets really fully. Scalability and security uh, to suit the available bandwidth, whether it is through a conference room, a home, or an airport, to a PC, a smartphone, or a tablet, um, is very important. And I think as cloud deployments become more and more prevalent um, as the days go by, mobile and employee-generated content uh, are also going to place new demands on securing video at all points in the stream. Um, and the ability to add permissions and storage points to secure and encrypt during delivery and at rest are going to be critical for uh, organizations to develop strategies around all this to fully harness the potential of your EVP deployments. Um, another important um, factor to evaluate with an EVP is that there is some form of analytics that really help you track your ROI to some extent. Um, so quality of experience and quality of service analytics uh, are really enabling uh, customers to gather greater insights into the impact of the video itself and to help you understand viewership trends within your enterprise a little better. Um, polls and Q&A, surveys that are employed to communicate with audiences during live webcasts uh, help to gather feedback. Uh, there's also graphical dashboards in some cases that accumulate statistical information and represent, uh, represent performance metrics of video. All of this is important to measuring the intended effect of your video asset. Um, finally, the whole solution itself needs to be interactive, it needs to be intuitive, easy to use, and self-service, ideally, so that the business user is able to go live within a matter of minutes and present his or her content. Um, so to wrap up, I kind of leave you with some closing thoughts. Um, some facts, figures, and analysis might seem obvious to some of you. Of course, millennials are growing. Of course, there's a device boom. Uh, but what we hope that you ponder over and the question we hope that you ask yourselves as IT strategists and business enablers and corporate communicators is, are you making that connection to your employee engagement strategy? Are you making that connection to your IT investment strategy? Um, are you tailoring your messages and your media to capture the attention of millennials and those younger to them who have only ever lived in the video era? Do you have the infrastructure and technology partners in place to deliver some of those messages? Um, so I leave you with these three key takeaways from my presentation, which is enterprise video is a must have in the era of the millennial workforce. Um, finding innovative ways and formats uh, using which to engage your employee uh, base is going to be important going forward. Live streaming is here and it is only going to grow over um, the next few years to come. And providing your employees with a high quality scalable video experience is going to be critical moving forward. I think the question in 2017 is not why, uh, but how you will make all of this happen. Um, and we think organizations must craft a holistic enterprise video strategy and choose partners that best fit your enterprise video strategy needs uh, in order to prepare for the workforce of the future. Uh, so there we have it. I've said my piece. Uh, thank you so much uh, for listening in. I think it's time for some Q&A. So Darian, it's back to you questions coming in from our audience. Um, the first one is, can you, uh, can Frost and Sullivan 
provide an estimate for what the penetration is of enterprises that actually have adopted enterprise-wide video solutions? Hi, this is Mukul, and uh, I can start with that. Uh, it, it is a uh, embarrassingly low number, but it is understandable. Uh, we are talking about purpose-built solutions. If you're looking at the overall total addressable market, that there is not a single vertical out there that does not require an enterprise video platform. But when we are looking at uh, the served addressable market where people are looking at purposeful solutions, it's been a fairly new market. Uh, um, uh, we, we are looking uh, at, I believe, uh, less than uh, two or three percent penetration. So we're looking at a massive opportunity out there right now as companies are clamoring, clamoring to figure out uh, what their strategy is going to be, what their specifications are, how are they going to sp scope out their rollouts for enterprise video. There's a lot of experimentation going on. And early on, a lot of people also try to do it in-house. And uh, very soon, they're looking at the total cost of ownership and the economic impact and realizing that they need to go for a purpose-built solution. So uh, I'll have Anisha also... Um, uh, uh, provide her feedback, but in essence, it is uh, a phenomena that has uh, uh, the, this, the, the business imperative to follow through on de uh, deploying enterprise video has uh, never seen traction as we have been seeing, especially over the last 18 months, and we are not seeing that abating anytime soon either. But Anisha? So I agree with what Mukul is saying. I think uh, more and more uh, enterprises in the past were used to kind of piecemealing some of these solutions. So they had somebody for you doing their on-demand video, um, another partner for their virtual events, another partner for live. But more and more, we're seeing that come together, and we're seeing a single platform and more more enterprise video adoption, uh, enterprise-wide video adoption um, over the past couple of years than ever before. Uh, Mukul's right. I think the the served addressable market right now is a very very small portion of the total addressable market. It stands at about 2.4 percent. Um, I think the enterprise video market today is about the $300 million, uh, million dollar mark, and it's growing at about 20%, and we're going to see that growth um, go very steadily into the future up until about 2025. Um, the homegrown solutions were, uh, were pretty commonplace uh, in the past, but I think enterprises have come to the realization that it is cumbersome to manage, and it's one of those things that they are going to just let the experts handle it. And that's why we see uh, the enterprise video platforms market doing so well as a result. Another question, what is the enterprise appetite for cloud solutions versus on-premise? I'll, I'll take a first stab at that and then pass it uh, over to Anisha. So uh, this is very interesting because it, it is so dependent on use case, it is so dependent on the legacy IT. But what we are finding out is increasingly people are more and more interested in uh, uh, cloud portability, um, uh, the, the flexibility, agility that they can get. Um, because if you frankly look at the procurement process, the decision-making process, it's uh, typically threefold. The business user understands a problem. Um, you have to get the technocrat on board. The technocrats typically are dealing with doing a lot with little. And once they are also on board, there's a bureaucrat somewhere with the purse strings uh, asking if it ain't broke, why fix it? So that's a very simplistic way, but you know, it, it is that sort of a broad three-pronged approach. Um, uh, so when we are looking at the flexibility that the cloud provides and uh, helping many of those line of business managers get up and running, uh, really fast, uh, not having to fight for CapEx, being able to get the foot in the door with OpEx, being able to then use that as uh, 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 that, that early success to uh, fuel future deployments within the organization. Those are all very critical elements going into how people are thinking in terms of the deployment topo topology they would like to go after. But uh, Anisha? So in the past, we used to see that financial services organizations or government and defense contractors, for example, uh, were completely on premises. But I think that's changing uh, very quickly if it hasn't already changed. And we're seeing 
uh, that there are more and more cloud deployments now, and I think that's going to be the trend moving forward too. For enterprises that aren't comfortable with you know, a pure cloud solution, there are hybrid offerings uh, where the application is managed in the cloud, where the delivery is still kept uh, behind the firewall, and that's become an attractive option for many organizations. Also, I think um, that pure cloud solutions um, more and more are becoming a great way to reach uh, remote locations and smaller offices where companies want to avoid making a significant infrastructure investment um, and also for SMBs. Uh, so that's where we're seeing uh, cloud ethic at the moment. Various questions about uh, web conferencing services. We just use our web conferencing service for live broadcasts. Why, why do we need a separate platform for this? Just uh, in a nutshell, uh, something that Anisha talked about quite a bit, when you're looking at the video use case within the organization, when you're looking at not just live, but you're looking at on demand, when you're looking at it just beyond delivering video, you're also looking at content curation, uh, indexing, being made, making it available for later on demand viewing, uh, the discovery of content, all of those things. I mean, when you're looking at an enterprise wide video strategy, uh, your ability to choose a solution. I mean, uh, people keep talking about uh, online video. And yes, there's no rocket science in that. My 11-year-old niece can publish video online, but that is not what we're looking at. Uh, similarly, when you're looking at the very, very traditional webcasting solution, it is very good at what it did and still does, and that is webcasting. But is that your inter entire enterprise video strategy? Uh, and when you start asking your questions and looking at what you need that enterprise video tool to do for your organization, it is uh, the use cases are well, well beyond webcasting. Uh, what you're looking at is also uh, from an overall, uh, considering a lot of your branded intellectual property now resides in some sort of a video asset as well. Being able to manage all of that from creation all the way down to consumption becomes that much more critical. But uh, Anisha? Uh, typically, we see the largest global uh, enterprises with a really dispersed workforce are using these solutions. And these enterprises are global and they have time shifting workforces. So live is great and it's extremely important and critical to have. But you know, there needs to be an on-demand counterpart somewhere in there so people can watch it and consume uh, that content anytime, anywhere and on any device. Because that's what they're doing in their everyday lives and in the consumer landscape. That's what they expect to do at the enterprise. Um, so, which is why ideally that demand for a single solution um, that can handle live and on demand, that can handle internal and external use cases seamlessly and deliver high quality, you know, broadcast uh, quality content live and on demand becomes important. Um, isn't it just too hard for employees to create good quality videos? Do they still need professional producers, cameras, etc.? Uh, and that's that's uh, that's actually a very interesting question. Uh, we have seen the democratization of content creation, and people are looking for that easy button. I mean, you, you, uh, there, there is a lot that has now been uh, made available uh, across the organization, across different roles and titles, so that they can engage in a very dynamic and interactive way using enterprise video by making those tools. Uh, much easier to work with. We are seeing endpoints everywhere. We are seeing uh, uh, camera resolutions uh, at those endpoint points go up significantly. We are seeing a lot of up upgradation of IT infrastructure. Uh, but um, at the same time, these things have to be planned. So it is not, it, you can't also have a free for all. Uh, one of the things I mentioned in the earlier dialogue was. Uh, uh, your, your branded intellectual property. Uh, who is the audience for all of this? So, uh, you, you don't want to compromise on any of that. Quality of experience, quality of service is extremely important and really depends on uh, which vertical you're in. I was uh, working with, with one of the largest uh, uh, banks in the world on trying to define their enterprise video strategy. And uh, for them, it is extremely, it's so regulated Everything has to be vetted uh, by a zillion other people before, even uh, when you're talking about an internal audience. Uh, 
uh, they want to make sure they've got their I's dotted and T's crossed multiple times. And then I was talking to one of the largest tech firms and we were trying to figure out what sort of a video strategy they had till now, which was a, literally a free for all. Anyone with any sort of a camera could record anything, throw it up on an internal portal that they had put together. There was not really much searchability and it was more like, uh, well, uh, if your video is really that interesting, then it will drift up to the top. If it's really not that great, people won't watch it. It's going to wallow somewhere in, in the, down there. Uh, so uh, those are two extremes that I just talked about where it is highly, highly regulated and another place where there's literally little to no oversight. Both are extremes. Both have serious pitfalls. Both also have uh, things working for them, but what companies are finding right now is they want to empower their workforce to be able to use these tools to interact more, collaborate more, drives the productivity. It is a very, very sticky experience. Um, uh, the, the, it's not just the tangibles, but the intangibles going along uh, have increased significantly. Uh, uh, Dan Rayburn, who is also principal within our team, was talking about how when streammedia.com moved its tutorials from text-based to document-based to uh, video, the stickiness, uh, uh, the amount of time people spent on the, the site uh, suddenly just uh, uh, increased by uh, multiple magnitudes. Uh, so uh, it's, it's, it's not an easy answer to say, uh, uh, talk about how, uh, uh, what corporate policy is. Uh, it is uh, it is an extremely unique thing depending on the company, the sector you're in. But one significant trend we are seeing is that there is tremendous encouragement uh, across uh, the workforce to engage with each other using video. Uh, different people are defining their policy, so it's very important that the enterprise video platform is flexible enough to incorporate uh, a lot of these different policies, being able to also track, have reporting, have analytics so that people can actually measure uh, how, um, what is the efficacy of their video strategy? Uh, Anisha? Um, I agree with Mukul, and I don't think there's very much I can add to this, but I will say that the EVP needs to be flexible, like you said. I do think that there are use cases for both. Um, so camera content is great. You know, a lot of the employee generated content is uh, shot on iPhones. Um, an Android phone. So that's sometimes great for training video. It's great for sharing on enterprise social media, for example. Um, but I think CEOs and heads of departments, when they talk to their employee base, uh, they want that to be perfect because they are perfectionists. They want the best. Uh, they want a branded experience. Uh, they want production quality equipment to be shooting that. Um, so I think it just makes it more engaging overall. And I think that, you know, to some extent, uh, also affects the time that is spent watching that video. I think uh, also for, you know, it depends on vertical to vertical, of course, but in the healthcare vertical, for example, in surgical suites, in hospital rooms, um, in research labs, you also want the best quality video. So that's not a place for, uh, you know, lower fidelity experiences. So many of those uh, use cases now are also being powered by 4K video. Uh, and that's something that we're going to see moving forward as well. There's a question for Frost and Sullivan. Uh, where do you guys uh, see the consolidation of video happening in the enterprise and collaboration technologies? Uh, so absolutely, it's very, very significant because uh, again, uh, harking back to something that I've already mentioned a couple of times, there's just so much branded intellectual property right now residing in a video asset. So when you're looking at many of these time-based assets, uh, and it's it's not just as uh, uh, just as a webinar. The, the Sony use cases from career development and training and compliance governance issues because of which video is being used in so many different ways. Uh, uh, Anisha talked also about the use uh, use case of uh, um, uh, executive broadcasts and stuff like that. Uh, town halls, uh, you know, people talking about the vision. Uh, senior management talking about the vision, trying to uh, get that uh, across all employees, being able to uh, use video as a collaborative tool. Uh, you don't want any of those assets, A, to disappear and just, you know, have uh, languish in some sort of a silo. So one of the things that uh, 
uh, we have seen uh, increase quite a bit, whether it is from the marketing use case where we are looking at that as a key content marketing capability and you know, a lot of partnerships with marketing automation platforms, for example, or within the enterprise information management uh, use case where um, uh, many of the platforms uh, really don't do a great job of being able to manage video. They're more set up from, from when you're talking about collaboration and management uh, to deal with static content. Uh, Time-based content is also more on a file level, not extremely searchable. So the, you, know, you compromise on discovery and stuff like that. So, and as we have seen video, just in terms of volume, become the fastest growing content type within the enterprise. Uh, the emphasis has now shifted. People are looking at, okay, how can I get the capabilities of being able to uh, collaborate on video? And that starts really with being able to manage it, making it much more discoverable, being able to then assign um, uh, usage rights and stuff like that, rights-based access, security, all the different enterprise protocols that we would associate with regular documents. Uh, so that is where we are seeing a lot more integration and interoperability with EBPs. Um, uh, Anisha, in case you want to add something to that. Sure, uh, I think that's a great question. And um, I think more and more for enterprise video to uh, really be used and adopted enterprise-wide from the smallest offices to the largest ones. Um, you need to integrate with a lot of these other enter widely used enterprise software, right? Uh, so whether that is digital signage or video conferencing or social media or your ECM or ERP, it, that is what is going to help you um, leverage those video assets better and it will create more um, visibility for what you're making as well. Um, the, that marriage between the unified communications collaboration side and um, enterprise, the video and the enterprise video platform is something that we are seeing. We've been seeing happening over the past year or two, and that's again something that we're going to see uh, become a very important trend uh, going forward. Also, um, so as uh, like to say, I think this is a quote that I read somewhere. It's not what you upload, but with the strategy with which you upload, uh, that becomes important uh, for really leveraging enterprise video assets and to have that true enterprise-wide video adoption. Somebody asks, do you foresee um, a migration, a mass migration off of YouTube? A lot of companies have YouTube channels. Do you anticipate that at some point there'll, there'll be a video on demand migration? Yeah, so <laughs> uh, that is an interesting question. I would love to answer that on a consulting engagement, but I'm, I'm just kidding. Uh, there, there, uh, it is very important. It has business ramifications uh, all across the value chain. We have spoken with a lot of companies, and there, there is a place for everyone within the ecosystem, and that's the beauty of it. Uh, understanding that you have to have agility, the versatility, and uh, reaching the broad, uh, the broadest audience necessary. And that becomes very critical to understand who is that audience. When you're going to, uh, uh, what is the demographic of that, of that audience? Is it a B2B audience? Is it a B2C audience? What do you want to achieve from that? Because, you know, I'm, I'm not going to be putting up corporate training video on YouTube. That makes no sense. Uh, that is something intrinsically uh, confidential and from a compliance perspective, governance perspective. Um, you know, I might be training people who are, uh, uh, and my training methodology might be uh, differentiated for me within the industry. Uh, so there, there, there are just so many different uh, uh, critical issues surrounding that. Um, you know, there, there are so many use cases that are never ever going to be on that sort of a public platform. Uh, but then when you want to have that sort of an outreach, let's say you are in a business that is going after the cord cutting uh, younger millennial demographic, uh, and this is a public facing thing, you, it is more of in terms of marketing collateral, then absolutely, uh, you know, you want to have it on YouTube uh, because you're going to maximize the amount of eyeballs that you're going to get uh, by making it viral that way. So, um, uh, we are going to see a lot of a uh, lot more new video that is getting created, a massive amount of uh, volume of that. 
never ever going to any of these uh, channels, whether it's uh, any of the social channels uh, such as uh, uh, Facebook or uh, YouTube, or for, for that matter, even LinkedIn. Um, uh, they are going to stay within the enterprise and there's going to be, uh, uh, according to how we are seeing the market, our forecast, uh, that, that, that just that sheer amount of video is going to uh, uh, we eclipse a lot of uh, what we are seeing uh, um, uh, out there right now. But Anisha, in case uh, you have anything to add back to you. Uh, sure. Uh, so I think that YouTube is great, maybe functional when your company is still small. Uh, but as your enterprise grows, we're seeing that it's just not enough. And YouTube becomes very limiting at that point. Um, it is not made for the enterprise and, you know, as Mukul uh, mentioned, taking your branded intellectual property uh, that you put out in a video asset and trying to deliver that, uh, you know, over over YouTube sometimes just doesn't cut it. So I think uh, enterprise video platforms really make for better quality. It is tailored to authorize views, uh, viewers, the right audience. Um, it is secure. Um, it's meant to work on the, the corporate bandwidth and gives you tighter control. Uh, especially over conversational tools, and um, I think that becomes very critical moving forward. I also feel that you know the self-service um, trend that we're seeing uh, with webcasting and uh, enterprise video platforms um, really make uh, make it easy for uh, interested customers and enterprises to make that switch because it's no longer you know a hundred, two hundred thousand dollar investment. Um, you're, you are paying a monthly subscription fee, and that is, you know, more palatable to the everyday enterprise and consumer. Uh, I, I would like to uh, really, really quickly add one more thing to it. And again, something that we have mentioned already a couple of times, that is the ability to monitor and report. So from a compliance perspective, being able to look at metrics, understanding uh, almost everything within the enterprise is metric driven. Uh, it's very difficult, if not impossible, uh, to use a very um, uh, uh, sort of a social platform such as YouTube to get the metrics that you need or get the sort of interaction and feedback because you're just opening it to everyone, right? Uh, uh, you can have um, all sorts of people from all over the place uh, that uh, basically make it impossible to understand whether that initiative is working or not when you have it. Uh, you know, so uh, in your face out there in the public domain. So uh, just from a, a reporting uh, analytics perspective, having a, a, a system that meets your needs becomes that much more critical because uh, let's face it, I, we, 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 sooner or later someone is going to ask the amount of investment uh, in terms of time and money that is going into uh, video or the video strategy. What are the metrics? How are we defining success? And you can't use, uh, you know, I've had so many views on YouTube as a metric. That's such an important, important point. I'm so glad you brought that up. Um, we are right at the top of the hour, so I think uh, we should go ahead and just uh, close out our webinar. I'd like to thank Anisha and McCool so much for providing this terrific information. And also thank our guests for uh, joining this webinar and being part of it. Um, we'll send you a follow-up link and also um, give you the ability to download the full white paper. So thanks from all of us at VBRIC and um, you know, appreciate, appreciate the good research and insights.